This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, the reason that we uh, have moved to a classroom, so you're seeing a different backdrop, is because there were so many thousands of people by the shear, it wasn't enough place in the base Medrash. If you believe that, I guess you'll believe only other stories. No, actually, it's because they're moving chairs inside there. So, uh, for those that are joining us over here, the belt says of art like this. Life is a joke. So if life is a joke, how come so many people are depressed? The answer is they don't get the joke. They don't, uh, they don't get the right uh, pitch on what's doing. We're going to be saying, not tomorrow night, but uh, in about 48 hours from now, depending on what your schedule is, but more or less, you're going to be sitting with the Seder, and toward the end of the Seder, for those of us that are still up, we're going to be saying whatever niggin you use, Echad mi yadeya, Echad ani yadeya, Echad alikeinu shebashamayim uvaaretz, and then we're going to say, Shnayim mi yadeya, who knows one, who knows two, who knows three, who knows four, and so on. A word that I heard from Reb Meilach Biederman, he said there's the Zazan Gezunt, there's a man who became extremely rich, and the other brothers and brothers-in-law, they want to know why he became rich. The other brothers-in-law, they want to know why he became rich. Well, actually, no. They want to know how he became rich. They don't care why he became rich. And they're driving him nuts. And he mums the word. He says, I'm not talking about it. I am not talking about it. Bishum ain't oifenish. And finally, they invite him out at night, and they pour him a couple of drinks, and they pour him a few more drinks, and they loosen his tongue a little bit, and they relax him, and then finally, and they're talking about anything and everything except for why he became rich. And finally, they come around and they say, so by the way, why do you become rich? How do you become rich? And he gives out the secret. What's his secret? He says, the I shall be rich. So we sit down by the Seder. <coughs> and the Sutton wants to know, what is the key to our Simcha Sechayim? And the Sutton wants to know, what is our key to Simcha Sechayim? So we don't want to tell him. We don't want to say it. But slowly but surely, we have one cup of wine, we have another cup of wine, another cup of wine, I'll tell you the secret. It's because we believe that there is one Rabbi Nishalaylam in this world and he, we are in his hands. Now here's the trick. Life gets more and more challenging as we move on. Why does it get more and more challenging as we move on? It's the nature of life. It's the nature of the different things that we hear. Every problem that you hear, ignorance is... Uh, is bliss, you know, you marry off your first child, you have your first baby, like you're, you're flying high. Then as, it, as, as you go on, you're more concerned, you're more worried. Why? Because you hear so many stories of things that didn't go well. Or at least in our eyes it looks like we didn't go well. Like, why do I have to know all of this? We want the ignorance of youth, it's so beautiful. So we start out, Echad mi the little boy, he has such reina amunah, he has such pure amunah in the Rebbeinah Shalom. And as life goes on, it gets more and more challenging. What's the story? <coughs> the supervisor tells the individual, I want you to paint the yellow line, and uh, down the middle of the road, and the first day he covers a mile, very proud of him. Second day, three quarters of a mile, fourth day, half a mile, Fifth day, quarter of a mile. He says, "Why? Why is it? Why are you slowing down?" He says, "It's longer and longer to walk back to the paint can every single time. Um, it's it's it gets much more complicated for us to get back to the Makar. In some venue or another, doctor tells the guy, "You know, I want you to run three miles a day." He says, "Okay, I'll do it." You know, he calls up after thirty days. He goes, "Doc, I listened, but what do I do now? I'm ninety miles away from home." We we. We, we ha- always have to go back to the Echad Miyadeya. And as life gets complicated, it gets more and more complex. And it looks like, in our eyes, we see more and more contradictions. Echad Miyadeya, Shnaya Miyadeya, Shloisha Miyadeya. It gets more and more complicated. And until we zoom back to the Echad Miyadeya, it's, it's harder. It's harder and harder to get back to the can of paint, so to speak. It's like a, a, a board game. It goes from level to level. You know what I mean? And each time it gets tougher and it gets harder. Remember Kugeluk? Chaylik, who remembers playing Kugeluk? Chaylik, Aleph, who remembers? How many people remember playing Kugeluk? How many people played Kugeluk? 
There you go. There's Chelek Aleph, and Chelek Beis, and Chelek Gimel. I was horrific in Kogelach. I, I would do all the Yadim, Kogelach, flying pull out each window after, after each time. And then, the, then when you sit down and you want to teach your kid how to play, you go, your four year old, you say, let me show you. This is onesies, you know. And he goes, oh yeah. And the kid goes, whoop, 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 whoop. he's up to the fourth chaylik, you know. Boom, here. The 24th chaylik, you got to throw it up, stand on your head three times, you know, and catch it with your toes and flip it, and he's doing it, you know, and I'm going to show him how to do it. But life gets more complicated as we get older. And that's basically, if you follow through on the theme of this Echad Miyadeya, that's how it works. So that's how we're a little child, and, you re- and your mother tells you, Hashem gives you life to say Maida'ani in the morning. And our amuna is so pure. We say, yes, there's a bari oilam on the world. We don't doubt it. That's why the Hevel Piv shal tenoi, of Tanoika, Shal Beis Rabban, the Tefillah and Limit of little children is so potent and so powerful because their amuna is so pure. When you get older, we know we begin to question things because that's all part of me <coughs> down here in this world. Whereas the Brisk Ruff says, you know, the older you get, the further and further you are from uh, the world that you came from. So slowly the Sveikas and Amunah begin to set in. So we go from Echad Elekeinu Shana Shemayim of Aretz to the next step. And the next step is Shnei Luchas Habris. Shnei Luchas Habris means there's a contradiction. Uh-oh. There's, what are the Shnei Luchas Habris? There's two of them. One is Ben Adam L'chaveiroi and the other is Ben Adam L'mokin, Right. One side of the Luchas is Ben Adam L'chaveiroi and the other side of the Luchas is Ben Adam L'mokin. And very often they contradict each other. You want Shalom Bayis in your house, and you don't want to compromise in certain Ruchnias type of things. You want Ruchnias, and do I give my child the device that he's asking for? What if my kid asks for a touch art bar for Yafi Kaiman? What is the answer to those questions? How do you balance? How do you understand the Ahaba that you have to show? It gets very, very complicated. The Bein Nodam Lamakai, and the Bein Nodam Lachaveira, the Shnei Luchis Abris, the Shlomkov Zavil, who was an Ish Kadash. And he was fire against machine masses. He held, like many of the Chassidah Shirobanim, that machine masses was like, you know, all, 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 all fire against machine masses. And then his son-in-law got married to one of the Purushim in Yerushalayim. And for whatever reason, there are Yerushalayim that are that are makbid on eating machine masses. Yes, Rabbi Shalom no? mm-hmm. Shvajor, I think, only used to eat machine Dying masses. Fisher. Dying, Dying Fisher. Dying Fisher, there you go. Son of Zalman. So, so there his, his son-in-law... You know, uh, he, he, now there's a new Adam in, 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 in by, uh, there's a son-in-law whose father eats machine matzahs, and his father-in-law is, would throw the guy into the machine, but he was like, hey, shlov, he's a machine against machine matzahs. Obviously, maybe they didn't know that before the Shidduch, I don't know, but the Shidduch came to me anyway, so he came to Rav Shlomke, he says, what do I do? Am I going to eat machine matzahs? What am I going to do? I, uh, you're so against it. So Shlomke said, <coughs> whatever my cheshman is, is my cheshman. I want to tell you something. When you get up there in Shemayim, Okay? They're gonna, not going to ask you whether you ate machine matzahs or not, I promise you. When you get up there in Shemayim, they're going to hold you accountable for two things. One is Shemir Sanayim, how careful you were with your eyes, and the other is Nishvet Sitanayit, that you didn't hurt another yid. Just, just keep that in mind. Okay, those are the two capital cities. You control those capitals, you control, the, you, you, know, you, know, you didn't lose the war. Everything else you'll work out. I think we understand that we all know that Pesach especially these days leading to Pesach, is a potential power keg of conflict. Um, there's, there's a lot of financial, and somebody wants to ask me, How, what does Pesach cost for a big family? I, I, I say it's $100 an hour, generally. It's like a, talk, I have the cleaners, my, the guy by the door, what, the fish, fish is here, the fish, send the fish back. What, what? you know, there's my... I don't want to come look at the fish, we have to look at live fish. <laughs> live money, live fish. Why, he's asking for it? You know, it's just, it's just ongoing. It's just, it, it just doesn't stop. So um, it's, 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 it's a potential powder keg of conflict. And we all have misyonis. And some of our misyonis is to stand up to difficult shalom bias situations where you have to make difficult decisions about what gives, what doesn't give. Uh, if you have the money for Pesach, then you have the misyonis of helping others. Are you doing your responsibility? And some people have money and there are other issues going on in their life, which is robbing them of their menuchas and nevesh of Pesach. And Pesach is the Yom Tov And when there's something on your heart that's troubling you, or there's an ongoing issue going on, and you have to deal with Pesach, that's tough. That's very tough. Yeah, anyway, where's the sugya of Avelus in Gemara? Which Masechta? Where's the sugya? Which Masechta? Anybody? Masechta's? Masechta's Moed Kot. 
Right? So in the Allahis of Chalamoid, you have the Allahis of Avelis. Why would the Allahis of Avelis be in Chalamoid? Well, it's because if you, you know, Rahman al if someone starts sitting Shiva before Yom Tiv, Yom Tiv knocks out the Shiva. So Agav, we have all the other Allahis of Shiva. So Rabbi Tzadik and says, nothing is a coincidence. Even though the Gemara seems to go off on a tangent, but the reality is that everything is, the, is where it's supposed to be. Chazal Dafka put Avelis into Hilchas Yom Tiv. Because the Yom Tiv is Mantik the Avelis. In other words, a person is in a rotten mood when Yom Tiv comes, and you have the you to try to smile. That's very tough. It's very tough. And it, it, it's the Kairach. It balances the Avelis a little bit. It's, uh, somebody once asked the Skreder Rebbe's Chanavrach, it says, Shabbos Umelizek, Refuah Kroi Velavah. Right? Shabbos helps Refuah. So he said, I don't know if it was a doctor or a patient, or someone said, I see. When Shabbos comes, in a way, Chaylum get more sick. I don't know if that's true. So he said, you don't understand, the Rabbi Hashem arranges that if there's a night that he has to get sick, it should be on Shabbos, because Shabbos has, is the greatest antidote to neutralize it. That, that's the way it works. Like someone's saying, it's amazing. There's nothing wrong with his doctor's office. Uh, there's always sick people there. Well, naturally, because it's a doctor's office. Right? Um, the Rabbi Hashem, the, 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 the Avelis is, 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 there are certain problems that we have in our life. Once they heard this in the closing of the road, it's kind of there are certain problems that we have in our life. Whatever that particular problem is, whatever is on your heart now, whatever kept you up last night, and maybe keeping you up tonight or tomorrow night, chas uh, that, That's if you get to go to sleep. And you're saying to yourself, why Yom Tif? Why Hashem do you have to give me this problem on Yom Tif? Why can't I have Simchas Yom Tif? And the answer is because you're getting so much mileage, more mileage on that problem. In other words, if you had that problem in the middle of the year, it's difficult enough. If you had that problem on Yom Tiv, and you have to try to fight it off and have Simchas Yom Tiv, your schus is so great to neutralize that problem that you wouldn't be able to have this schus during the year. Whereas during the year, if you just said, Hashem, take the problem away, and we check your schus, and we say, the battery's empty, we have nothing left to help you neutralize the problem. But when it comes during Yom Tiv, and it's such a contradiction, and you say, Boy, please help me have Simchas Yom Tiv, the Rav Hashem says, that's what you're asking for, Simchas Yom Tiv? i got to help them have Simchas Yom Tiv. It opens up a back door to tefillah, to take away your problems. Plus, every problem is a Gehenna discount. You know, if not to, like the Masil Sisharim, and everyone's, and many say, if not for our Yisurim, on this world, man, we wouldn't stand a shot up there in Shemai. You know, we come along with our Yisurim, and we say, ah, ah, he's suffering. And every little thing is, is suffering. You put your hands in your pocket, the Gemara says, my keys, my keys! Oh, oh sure, there you are, yeah which happens to me like 10,000 times a day, that, that is Yisurim. You try to get your, your hand and it doesn't go into the sleeve. You ever had that? You put your hand in and it gets like stuck in the lining instead of the sleeve and you go through and it doesn't come out on the other side. You know what I mean? It's one of those neurologic things or like uh, after a haircut you swallow a piece of hair. You know, you know, you know, you know that feeling. Right? It's not like something, uh, you know, Someone's going to have a lot of Rahmanas on you for I never hear that happen. He has a hair and thing after a hair. People don't do that. You know, I never. He, he can't get his hand. He can't find a hole. You know. But in Shemayim, they count that. That's a Ganim discount. So you want to get the maximum Ganim discount. When, when, when an issue comes up on Yom Tiv, and you're fighting it off, the, the Gehenim discount that you get for, that, for, that, for those Yisurim, the mileage that you get is, is, is beyond. It's absolutely amazing. And, and Pesach, which is the Yom Tiv of Cheres, where, where by nature we have to feel free. And a person has ongoing issues in his life where he feels bondage. And he says, oh, my life is in your hands. Please help me. I don't know what's going to be, but you know what's going to be. So please let me put my life in your hands. The discount that you get for those Yisurim is, is tenfold, is a hundredfold, is a thousandfold. And that's why sometimes the Rabbi Tafka gives it to us in Pesach. Because if we weren't willing to have this on Pesach, we would have to have those Yisurim to get the same amount of mileage points in a much more severe way. So, you know, there's a famous story, I think we say it every year, or at least every second year, or twice a year, but I, I guess you're supposed to say it when you're supposed to hear it. The Heil Gechayz of Lublin, or many said, once said, after his say, there were, everyone sat there, and they saw Malachim, and they saw Leo Yanovi, and they saw like everyone. And he said, ah, my say, there is nothing compared to Berka say there. What Berka did in Shemayim is beyond imagination. You have no idea what Berka Seder did in Shemayim. Berka. So they all went to look for Berka. Berka must be a Lamed Vav Tzadik. Berka must be from the hidden Tzadikim of a generation. Imagine his Seder was more potent, accomplished more in Shemayim than that of the Heilig Echayz of Lublin. And they met Berka. Berka looked like he had a rough night. 
and they press him, they want the soydice, they, they want the shameice of matzah, he doesn't tell them anything. Finally, Berka, tell us what happened. Now do you say this? So he says the truth. Berka, he wasn't much of a bread winner, and he was even less of a matzah winner. And uh, came before Pesach, and his wife was saying, what's going to be? We have no matzah, we have no wine, we have no clothes for the kids, we have no shoes. And he's saying, why do you have to waste so many words? Just say, we have nothing. That's easier. And for that, he got a mop over his head. Okay? So, and he said, you see, we have a map, right? Before, now, Lamaisa, but Berka did bring, bring things home. Berka brought home chumras. Every year he had more chumras. This time he said, we're going to file the table down. We're gonna, they had this wooden table that stood on two crates. We're going we're to take a file, and we're going to file it down in case there's some chumras stuck into the wood. And we don't want to rely on kashering. And Berka's wife said that's not necessary because we didn't have any food on the table the entire year. So what are you kashering it from exactly? But he said, no, it's a new chumr, and he, he's the whole day filing, and the whole house is full of sawdust. <coughs> and finally, like two hours before this man, someone realizes that it's pretty dark in Berka's room, and, uh, you know, everyone comes through, <coughs> local Moaz uh, funds, and all of a sudden there's a beautiful tablecloth, and there's, there's candles, and there's matzah, and there's wine, and there's eggs, and there's... Everything you need, they're good to go. And Berka leaves the shul, and his wife finally, a moment of Menuchas and Efesh, and she walks by the table, and her apron gets stuck in one of the splinters of wood that's protruding from the table after Berka's Mardika filing job. And as she turns around, before she chaps what's happening, the entire board, which was standing on two crates, came crashing down. And there's this huge avalanche, and there's this mushroom cloud of eggshells and broken matzois and charoises and everything else up in the air. And she explodes. She explodes. She is so angry. <coughs> and Berka comes home from Shul. He's all, sm- <coughs> He's all smiles. He looks around and he says, ay, 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 ay. And his wife gives it to him like he basically tears him apart limb by limb, piece by piece. She says to Shmazel Ben Shlomazel Ben Shlomazel Ashada Soridars that never she was the worst thing in the world when she married her. That was Tisha B'Av and that was she is just taking him apart. And Berka wants to answer back. Berka's in the wind-up to answer back. Berka's going to give her Kefal Kaflayim. She shot a Scud missile. He's going to shoot back, you know, so, you know, B-52 cluster bombs. He's about to take... All of a sudden he goes, stop. This is, this is who I am. This is my life. This is my Matzev. It's the night of the Seder. He puts his head down and he goes, God, whatever you want, whatever you want. And he says to his wife, you're right, okay? So let me pick up the broken piece of matzah. Let's pick up the broken piece of eggs. And he puts everything back on the table and he talks to her. He says, what should I do? Is this who I am? And he sits down and she finally calms down. And they sit down. So they were mahadir and yachas that night. And not only broke the middle matzah, they broke everything else that was on the table. Well, the maisa, your yaisa, your kazayas matzah, they were yaisa, their and by the end of the night, remember they were calm, they were even joking, and the Chayza said, ah, Berka said that. But Berka did in Shemayim, no one did. Absolutely no one did. Now, every time I say the story, usually I get a call from a woman that's not very happy, and she says, why in all stories is it the woman that's impossible? You think there's never men that are impossible? Right? Why is Berka the hero, and his wife looks bad? So I always answer, no, you didn't hear right. I said Bertha. I said I said the whole Seder was in the schos of Bertha. She stood up to her crazy husband who yelled at her. She didn't answer that. Really? Yes. That's all. I just, that's just my answer. Uh, I had a friend who told me that he said over the story, he has a shul someplace, and he got a call. A guy was screaming at the top of his lungs. His name is Berka. He didn't like this story. He said, my name is Berka, and there is no anger problem in my house, he yelled. It wasn't very convincing, you know. He said a story with uh, somebody came to the Chavetz Chaim. He wrote a, uh, wrote a safer about the ill, Ill- class, how terrible anger is. And uh, Chavetz Chaim wanted to get a stomach from the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim didn't uh, want to give him a stomach. So he asked Chavetz Chaim why. So Chavetz Chaim told him that before I wrote my safer on Lashon Hara, for 40 years, four zero years, I never, ever spoke Lashon Hara. So I'm not sure if you were on that level about caste. He blew up. He said, how dare you? How dare you accuse me of everything? How dare you accuse me? I get angry, you know. <laughs> so, um, 
I say, always say, yeah, I say, you should have told the guy. I didn't say Berch. I said Berch, <laughs> Berch, and the guy said, yeah, Berch, Berch attack has an anger problem. That, that was looking at Berch. He has an anger problem, right? You know. You know, it says, Kalan Agadim, Kalan Agadim, Adam Raya Chutz, is Minega Atzmei, the Boshem Tev. They say, Slanam Aswaram Tash, Kalan Agadim, that Adam Raya Chutz, what you see by somebody else, is usually Minega Atzmei. And that's interesting. I, in, in many of my stories, so I use the name Gimple. Gimple. I try to use an uncommon name because I don't want to, like, if I'm, you know, if I say Yankel's the Shlomazel, or Shloim is the Shlomazel, you know, or Mati's the Shlomazel, and, you know, I don't want to kids to make fun of Mati. So I once got a very legitimate call from the father, and he said his son, son's name is Gimple, you know. He's a big tzaddik, his shver's name is Gimple, and he gave that name, you know. And uh, he said, you know, all the kids make fun of my son. I said, well, I'm really sorry, it's the last thing in the world I intended was that the kids should make fun of your son because of my story. So he claimed, if I use the name like Mati or Shlaimi or Baruch or Chaim, so everyone knows a lot of Chaims, but if I use the name Gimple, Okay, all right. So I, I, I told him. I, I hear. I'm very sorry. So you know, Gabi Pollock, He's this great artist, and he, he put out. He puts out these series of books. So he has like the shlum, the shlumazel of all shlumazels in his character. And what's what's his shlumazel's character's name? Fischl. Okay, that's like his uh, this vagabond, this beggar that like whatever he does falls apart and he just crashes and bumps into everything and like every penny he has he loses. So I said, that's just great. If that wasn't bad enough, this Purim had a bunch of people going around with Fischl masks. You know what I mean? I feel bad for Fischl. I mean, uh, and my kid, he wanted the book, so he went to the Swarm store. He said, do you have the Fischl book? You know, the, the, the Fischl is like a little to doodle, and the guy says, your father? And, you know, like, it's a great. <laughs> just, uh, just wonderful. The reality is that the truth is that it could happen to Berica, it could happen to Bericha, it could happen to Berth, and it could happen to Basia. And the truth is that in a normal relationship, it happens to everybody. I think in every marriage or in every relationship, at one point or another in the course of life, so you are, you're, you're, you're both. You're both. Um, you're Berica and you're Bericha. You're Berica and you're Berica's wife. Uh, because relationships are like a valley. They're emotional dips. And you go up and down. You ever notice uh, by the end of a wedding, that's traditional, one of the last things that the band sings is the Rebbe of Melech dance. And it goes, you know, you know, na 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 And then you, you take a partner and you go over and under. Oh, you know what I mean? You, you go with something like this, you go underneath, over, under, over, and you go in and out. na 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 That's the Rebbe of Melech's nigan. And they say that <coughs> there's a Messiah to that nigan to sing that dance by the end of a wedding. Why? Because if you want to have Shalomayas, you got to know. You go under, you go over, you go under. You got to know when to go over, and you got to know when to go under. But you have two partners. The partners know when to go up, and they know when to go down. And the emphasis is that in every relationship, there's one side that's going to be down. And the other side has to support that side, whether it's the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband. And if they're both down, then they have to support each other, which is quite tough. Rabbi El Yerot, he was, uh, again, I heard the story from Rabbi Elch Biderman, he was the uh, Shamish B'Kaydish of uh, Shlom Kazavil, it was an Ish Kaddish. And he had gotten married a second, second time, but Shlom Kazavil told him not to marry her. It's interesting, he married her. You know, he listened to his Rebbe, everything, but it was B'Shayat to Shidduch Shagon. He suffered his whole life from her. And uh, there were boys that came to the Seder, and she once walked in, and she was angry about something, and she just kicked the whole table over. Everything just went crashing to the ground. It wasn't that her apron got caught in the snag. She kicked it, and she had a field goal. You know? And uh, Rav Elia said to the Bachrim, he said, what's called chayrus? What's called freedom? Freedom doesn't mean everything goes your way. Freedom means whatever happens to you, you say, okay, this is the situation. I'll pick up the pieces and go right. There can't be a greater chayrus than that. The Gemara tells us that there was a husband who said to his wife, why are you late? He was furious. She said she went through a mayor shear. Went through a mayor shear, go spit in his eye. Don't, you have, don't walk back through this door until you spit in his eye. She's crying as she goes back to this. She doesn't know what to do. The mayor knew what his Ruch HaKadosh, what he said. So um, there was a certain uh, refuah for a certain sickness in the eye that the only way it worked is if you spit into the eye. Human saliva went into the eye. So he said, oh, yeah, I have this pain in my eye. I have this sickness. Who can do this spit into my eye now? He said. And he was Miramis her to do it. And she did it. And he told her, go tell your husband that you did it. 
Now, why don't you just call in her husband and give him Mrs. Shmuz? You don't send your wife to spit into the Rav's eye. Because obviously he knew there was no one to talk to with his husband. But he had Rahmanas on her because of what she was suffering. And therefore, if Meir was willing to, the Talmudim said, you know, he went that far, he said, am I any better than Hashem, who allows his name to be erased because of Shalom Bayis? Um, it says, Asam Gevulech Shalom, Chelev Chitem Yazbiyach. Hashem makes boundaries of, of peace. Chelev Chitem Yazbiyach. And from the, the real, the Geshmak wheat, he'll satiate you. I once heard from one of my Rebbeim that there's different channels how a person gets Parnassah in Shemayim. Some people get Parnassah through the Shara Parnassah. Uh, some people get Parnassah through the Shara of Shalom Bayis. There's no Parnassah under Parnassah Shara. Well, you know, whatever, they, they either they depleted it or it's just not there. But what happens is the wife is really, really upset. She can't handle the fact there's no money. And he is saying, please, I want to avoid strife and machlaikis at all costs. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him the money through the Shalom Bayis angle. But he says, I come home with the money. In two seconds, it's not there. So what's the point of the money? And what he has to understand is that it could be if she wasn't so demanding, he wouldn't have the money. Because he's only getting the money because of the Shalom Bayis. Hasam Gevulech Shalom and Chelev Chetam Yazbiyach are connected. The, you know, Dabr HaMelech, they asked him, who do you want? You want an, you're, gonna, you're, you're in for a, a problem. You want an outside rebellion? You want a rebellion from inside. He said he wants a rebellion from inside. And that's enough Shalom rebelled against him. Because he said, well, I say he's better off with an internal conflict. I, I, I want to be very careful what I'm saying. Obviously, there are, I'm not, it doesn't apply to every situation. There are situations that are just insolvable. That's not uh, for a sheer. Of, that, that, that's for your personal consultation with your rav, with the people that are guiding you. But I mean to say the average everyday ups and downs, or even a little bit above the average ups and sides. And I've seen it many times. People that have internal conflicts in ho- at home, and they have to deal with it. And, and, and finally they said, enough is enough, and they put their foot down and they get their way. And all of a sudden there's an, there's an external conflict. All of a sudden there's an outside problem coming from a, from a neighbor, coming from a, whatever the source is. And they say, oh, you they, at least when I was at home, I knew there were red lines. You know, now I'm really in trouble. That the Rabbi Hashem always gives us the lesser of the problem. And the, the internal conflict of all those other issues that are going on. If a person has an Isha Ra, Eina Ra Yepnei Gehenim. He never sees Gehenim. You know that, that story the guy told the Shatchan? He says, I want a wife that's like the most nasty person in the world that ever existed. Because I don't want to go to Gehenna. So he goes out, he, he asks the principal for the, you know, the, the, the girl with the worst Midas in the world. And she says, you got her. Most selfish person in the world. And uh, it's all done. And we set the thing and then they, 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 he, he goes to see her and it turns out that she's very uh, nice. He says, uh, information is wrong. Don't worry. She's, don't worry. It's only about a date. You know, then they get married. He says, the Sheva Brach is still very nice. Don't worry about it. They're like a Shana Roshayna, don't worry. After Shana Roshayna, her true colors will come out. It's like the second year of marriage, and she's so nice to him. And she's always coming over and saying, what do you need? What do you want? He says, ah, what's going to be? He married her because he wanted to have Tsaris. So finally, um, she goes over, he goes over to you. He says, can I ask you a personal question? She goes, yes. With this big smile on her face. He says, I, 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 she says, I know what you want to ask. I know why you married me, and I want you to burn. Do you understand? That's I'm going to be so nice to you. Okay, but honestly speaking, the, 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 I saw someplace, it's not, it's Lav Dafka, a man that has a difficult wife. It's also a wife that has a difficult husband, and maybe even more so. But it doesn't mean your whole life is difficult. Everybody is, every human being is a difficult person on a given day. Every normal person on a given day is difficult, okay? Whether it's under pressure, whether it's for whatever reason. And when you tolerate your spouse, whether it's husband to wife or wife to husband, on that given day, then you get a huge Gehenna discount. And, 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 and we have no idea. So going back to his book, Taka, so he put out this book with a bunch of mashallah. So one of the things where official, official gets in trouble, is uh, his wife is, is screaming at him and she wants a, a clothesline. But he doesn't know where to get a clothesline. So he walks and he sees these uh, you know, the, the telephone wires. So he climbs up the pole and he starts cutting the telephone wires. And of course the anti-terrorist group comes and they grab him and they schlep him off and they want to have him executed. So the, and the general looks at this official and he says, the Shlomazel thing, you know, what, what were you doing? So he says, my wife wanted a clothesline. So the general says, you know, he needs a big, you know, give him a kick and th- throw him out of here. He's not a spy. Just give him a zet or a foolish Shlomazel. And he gives him this big kick you know, from behind, and he goes flying out the window in this cartoon thing. So I was just thinking to myself, so, 
And Ezra Fissel would have stormed back in. You're not going to kick me! Okay, so we'll arrest him as a spy and have him killed. You know, that's better. How many times do we get a kick in our pants, so to speak? And, and, and we're, we're so angry, right? What? No, no, I was so embarrassed. No, no, wait, my father-in-law said this. My mother-in-law said this to me. No, I'm not going to... Don't you know what the Rav Hashem is doing for you? You'd rather be arrested as a spy? Don't you understand that the Rav Hashem is giving you a lesser level of where you are? So... Um, Got to go over and under. That's where you are. That's where you are. So let's run through quickly the Echad Miyadeya and see how it goes. Because I know you're all anxious to get back home and uh, help your wives. Um, it's much easier to sit here by a shear and hear about how hard it is to put up with a difficult wife while your wife is cleaning the oven. You know what I mean? So, but, um, so, so we, we say Echad Miyadeya, everything is divine. Then we say Shnei Luches Abris. And there's conflict, and we say, but Lamaisa, the conflict is also a chalik of the Yashgacha. Then we go a step further, it gets more complicated. Shloisha miyadeya, the Shloisha avais. The Shloisha avais, by, by personality, by nature, are completely different. There's chesed, there's gvura, there's tferes. How does it all work together? And what do you do when chesed and gvura are in conflict with each other? What do you do when you don't know if love is to be tough? Well, when you're in mood of being tough, you have to, you have to show love, and, and you're not sure which way to go. And you're saying, why are you giving me these nesiyainas? Shloisha miyadeya. You know, I know someone that uh, he remarried. And uh, his, 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 you know, he has his biological daughter and he has his wife's daughter. And he's very nice to both of them. And he told me once that, uh, and he married them both off, and, 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 and really in, in the best way possible, given them nesiyainas. And you couldn't even tell the difference, which was his real daughter, which is not his real daughter. He once told me an amazing thing. He said that once, like, his stepdaughter became of age, he never touched his own daughter, because she shouldn't feel like he loves one more than the other. And in my mind, I said, but is that fair to your daughter? I like that, that she never got a pat on the back from, from her father. And he, he almost read my, my question. And he said, look, I'm not, I don't want anyone to pass him from this year. You know, they're just, this is for Ravon in, in your situation. But just, so what he said was, so he knew he had to have an extra smile to her to compensate for it. And, and the other thing is, he said, look, whatever reason that he was in a second marriage, that was a hashgacha. He said, the Rebbe should put me in this matzah, and this is my Nisayim, so there must be a way of me showing equal love to my daughter and stepdaughter. In other words, if it's shloisha miyadeya, chesed and gvura are in conflict, and yet we say, look Rebbe Hashem, if you put me in this situation, I really wanted to, I will do my best, given the circumstances, to, 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 to connect chesed and gvura. This is also, echad elekeinu sheba shemayim v'aretz. And as we go further, it gets even more complicated as life goes on. Arba imois, right? Arba miyadeya, arba niyadeya, right? So, so who are the four imois? So, so think about the, the conflict in their lives. Ve'ene leya rakas. Leia is growing up thinking for sure she's gonna, that her husband is going to be this savage Asaph, and she cries her heart out. And then she gets married there on the Sinai, because Rachel is is, 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 is is the favorite in the marriage. And she has children, and, and the pain that goes on back and forth. Now she's willing to risk her life for Rachel, despite the fact that Rachel is her competitor. She's her tsara. And when she's about to have an extra son, she says, Hashem, switch it for a daughter. Let Dina, so that she doesn't have more, sh- that Rachel doesn't wind up with even less shvatim than the shivchais, right? And Rachel gives everything away for Leah. And yet here Leah is the one that has the children. She doesn't have the children. Think about what was going on in their lives. I, I forgot who says it, but someone says that. You know, Leah cried before, she didn't have to cry afterwards. Rachel didn't cry before. She's the Fastoya, she has Alamilas, she's going to Yaakov, she's destined for Yaakov, and she's still crying to this day. Either you cry before, you cry after. It doesn't mean that they lost out. It means each one of our Imois is doing their thing. Leah cried in her tears brought the Shvatim to Klal Yisrael. And Rachel is crying to bring the Shvatim back to Eretz Yisrael. But in, in, in our lives, there's going to be a point in our lives where we have to cry. It's part of this world. Why Hashem does it that way? When we get up there, we'll understand. But right now, we have to understand, even in the seemingly impassable conflict of the Arba Imois, we still say, Echad Alekeinu Shadashemayim Uva Aretz. We keep on moving. We keep on getting there. Echad Alekeinu Shadashemayim Uva Aretz. When we get up to the Shemaim, we're going to see, oh, down here in Aretz, it made sense. And I also tell you the story many times. I heard from my good friend, Rav Moshe Willem. He says his father was an Ish Kaddish, and uh, Zayda was Rav Yama Willem, and Sada Tarvadas. And they lived in uh, Williamsburg. And one very hot Shabbos afternoon, a, guy, a man walks into Shul, and he's like, ah, oh, 
he's like falling apart. He's like one big sweat pool. And who, where are you walking from? He's walking from Bedford Stuyvesant. His name is Isaac, Isaac Lubatrin. Isaac, you want to come home for a meal? So he comes to them for a meal, and then he sleeps on the couch in the afternoon, and by night they drive him back to Bedford Stuyvesant. And that started a 15 year thing. Every Shabbos he was there. He came, and he was there, and he went to sleep, and Matzah Shabbos they drove him home. In his eyes, Havdalah was Bari Mari Eish, and Bari Minif Samim, and driving home Isaac. And one day he just disappeared, he never came back. Gone, like vanished in thin air. You know? He ate for yes for 15 years, he just disappeared. He says when his father passed away, and uh, his father was at Sadiq, it's a story on its own, he was sick for many years, Ish Kaddish. His father passed away. He's talking about the story, goes back 20, 30 years. You know, and, and they bring him to the plot where he is, and they look at the plot right next door, Isaac Obatra, buried right there. How, it, it, only one of Hashem put these two together. I actually went to see it, and it's Mamish one, one right next to the other. In Shemayim, they knew why these two people had to be together. We do things down here, and we, we're frustrated. I'm doing so much for someone. I'm not getting it back. Trust me. Then we go right through. I'll go fast because running out of time. Chamisha Chum Shaytaira, Shisha Sidre Mishnah. 613 mitzvahs. And many of them conflict each other. There's a mitzvah to give a get. Is that a mitzvah? That applies to everyone. I hope not. Rahman al Islam, the Rebish Tapid, and his Berch Yarid all of the mice. The Rebish is willing to erase his name for Shalom Bayas. There's a mitzvah of the Bimah for Shubh, the mitzvah of Pidim Pechel, there's a mitzvah of Egwa Rufa, there's a mitzvah of the Da'al of Mises Bez, and all these mitzvahs. How does it interrelate? And the and, 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 and Bechlau, right? If you're a Kayan, you have a mitzvah to give Trumma. You, you you, you, you're taking Trumma. If you're Yisrael, you're giving Trumma. If you're a Kayan, you're Makar Kachim. I can't be Makar Kachim. Says the Arachayim Kaddish that a Kaddish Baruch Hu puts you together in such a way and brings you down to this world again and again until you interrelate and you connect your Makayim, the 613 mitzvahs. But that's only if we're willing to go through the Nesiyinus that we have. Bein bein ish liyishtai, bein ish lechaveiroi, bein shver l'shviger, bein bein edim l'shver. Whatever it is, Hashem has you right where you're supposed to be, and you connect with different people. And the Chayvus Lubavitch also says, if you have an internal conflict with someone and you avoid machlokes, you, your your schusim are fused, so to speak. And the Rebbeinu Shem has this all figured out. Echad alekenu shav Hashemayim va'aretz. Well, let's say the guy comes and uh, he's to Rothschild, you know, he wants money. So the secretary says, okay, 50 rubles. My brother, I have a sick brother. Fine, he goes, uh, here's 100 rubles, 50 for your brother. He comes back every single year, 100 rubles. For him, for his brother, every single year, 100 rubles. Now, when the brother dies, he comes back the next year, and they give him 50 rubles. Why only 50? He always give me 100. The guy says, your brother died. He goes, who's the Irish? My brother or Rothschild? What do you mean? Like, you know, uh, I inherit my brother. So give him your 50, right? We inherit each other. The, the, the people, the Rebbe makes those appointments. And, 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 and you would say, well, how did I wind up? No, how did you, the Rebbe put you here. That's how you wound up. Because this is your Nisayan. This is your Tafkin in life. To make this work. Not to prove yourself. You're not gonna, that no one's going to push you around. And then comes Shemayin Miyadeya. Comes all the Nisayinists represented by Bris Mila, the Nisayinists of, 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 of Taiva. And we say those Nasianas are also tailor made for you. You couldn't be who you are if not for your Nasianas. All of your greatness is your Nasianas. All of your Parnas is because of your Nasianas. It's Echad Alekainu Shem Hashemayim of Aretz. It comes back to Hashem. The Kedushas lady says, Yisachar Chamar Garem. His Chumriyas, his Taiva, that was Garem's greatness. It's only because we do our best to stand up to Shmir Sanayim, to Shmir Samachshava, to the whole slew of Nesiyanis that face us on a day-to-day level. And we were put into this world because our greatness is contingent on standing up to those Nesiyanis. And then we say, Tisha Niyadeya, right? Tisha Yachi in, 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 the, in the nine months that we're in our mother's womb, so there's a Malach that comes and teaches us Kala Tarekula. And there's a Malach that takes us on a tour and shows us the whole world, the Gemara says, from the moment we're born, to the last shovel of earth. And then we're born. We have to believe in the course of our lives that we're following a plan. The world is not Hefka. Then we go to the Aseris Hadibris, which correspond to the Asara Mamoris, to the Asara Makris, to the Svasemis, to the Asara Nesiyonis, that Ram Avinu had. The, the, the Aseris Hadibris represent the, the, the full nine yards of all the Nesiyonis in our life. I once had the schools to go into a shtayman, and I was, trying to, like, I was trying to show off. And I wanted to say, I speak to the rabbin, like, what Indian should I talk about? And I thought of, I had a real complex answer. And he looks at me, and then he sizes me up in two seconds. And he says, when you talk about the Aserah Sedibris, I'm like, you know, tell him, let him kaim leisertzach, and leisignif, what's the shayla? Okay, guys, leisertzach, and leisignif, you know? Steinman is very sharp. Somebody told me that a man once came into him, and he said, I am Eliyoh Hanavi. 
So Shtayim and sent him, yeah? Okay, so Kav Biyarba Amos. So let's hear, you know, the Gemara has a bunch of questions about, uh, you know, what's it then if you drop uh, Paris and it's spread over a certain amount? You have to give it back. And like, Eliyoy well, will answer. So, so what's the answer? You have to give it back or not? Oh, you don't know? So you're not Eliyoy and other, you know what I mean? Uh, who are you? And then we go to the next step. And so we say, all of our Nesiyayinais, it's all Echad Alekeinu Shabbat Shemayim of Aretz. Trust me, if we had just one flash of that Aragon, as we saw, a split second before we were born, and a split second after we leave this world, it'll all make sense. It all the worries, every sleepless night, all the things that you went through in your life. And then we go, Echad Asa Kaychavaya, the 11 stars, the Demus of the Kaychav, I'm not going to get into it now, for a few reasons, one, because I don't know what I'm talking about, but more or less, the, the, the constellations of the stars keep changing. It's, it, the, it really, the stars stay in the same place. The world changes, so it looks to us like it's different. The ritzayness of a person are constantly changing as we go through the course of our lives. And it's the, every person in, in, in the level of life that he is in, it's designed for him. And then the, the 12 shvatim, we are all different, and we all have to interconnect with each other. And, and each time we go back to the Echad as much as it becomes more diverse, as much as it looks like there's more conflict, as, a, as much as it looks like the world is just going to pieces, but it's a bigger necessity to say it's all Echad And our job is not to understand why. To us, it looks like there's more and more conflict as life goes on. It divides itself more and more. And we have to say, but I have to be Maimon. There's one Rabban Hashem that's behind it. Somebody once asked the Imri Chayim, he said to him, How? it doesn't make sense. You could have a, a, a beggar laying on the street, nobody helps him. Maybe somebody gives him a quarter. Then you have a guy acting in a role, the prince and the pauper. He's acting like the pauper. He wins an Academy Award. He wins an Emmy. He makes millions, besides how much he gets for putting his picture on his pair of sneakers or something. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. So the real poor man gets nothing. And, and the fake person, he gets billions. So the he said, why? So the Yimichayim said, what do you say? So he said, because it's an Eilam HaShakr. The Yimichayim said, no, I'll tell you a different shot. He says, a Yid sits down to the Seder night. And he's, he's like, he's drunk. He's happy, the world is his. Okay, very nice, you smile. So the Yid sits down to the Seder night and he has every reason in the world to cry. He has every reason in the world to beat Zabrachim. He has every reason in the world to, to, to really like, give up. And he says, Rabbi Shalom, you want me to smile. I'm going to smile. He's an actor. He's smiling to his kids. He's smiling to his wife. She's smiling to her husband. You know how much Rabbi Shalom pays for that? Guzmoy, some mommy. That's what it means. You know, somebody once said, that uh, the brain is the most important part of our body. But then again, it's our brain that's telling us that, so who says it's true, right? <laughs> because the reality is that the brain is limited. We only see things in certain perceptions. Remember that thing was going around for a while? Somebody did an ad for Coke in Estro. So the ad is you see a guy laying on the floor, and he's dying, and somebody brings him a Coke, and he gets up. Oh, he rejuvenated, and he's up, and he's alive, how he drinks. But he didn't have that in Eretz Yisrael, Hebrew goes from right to left. So you see the guy, a coke, he takes it, he collapses, falls on the ground, drinks, he's dead. <laughs> it went the other way. You know. Our brain goes the other way. We don't know how to read it. To us, it looks like it's the end of the world. It's really life that's just starting. It's just starting. It's a whole, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different Metsias. You know, you get out there on the streets of Barapak and Falapos, you feel the pressure on the streets, the bumping, the cars, doesn't move, 12 o'clock at night, you know, frenzied guys working, the guys that have to work in the houseware stores and the hardware stores, you ever see what they look like this time and yeah. here, uh, you know, like, you know what I mean the guy that owns the store in the or the worker, you know what I mean, the guys that work in the takeout stores, you know can you play a uh, pastrami sandwich, okay here, can you take your hand out from in between oh sorry, I don't know. It's like, you know, like people just like dropping on the floor, you know so uh so my she saw first I was like, in the and that's Israel now. So he called me to tell me this story. And I I, I wanna I wanna put a disclaimer on it because I, I don't believe that I I shouldn't even be saying a story like this. But I I'm um which is always a good way of getting people to listen. But uh it's an old trick. But uh when I, when I say a disclaimer, I mean, I'm, I'm not in any way suggesting. I, I fold up like a cheap camera, you know. I'm, I'm not good at missing this. But this is what he told me. He said he went out, tried to get something to eat with his family, and uh, tonight, which was a few hours ago, and uh, he's going from one restaurant to the other restaurant, and whatever, and everyone's cashering. Forget it, it's over. And I'm just looking for a meal, you know, besides for falafel. How many falafel bowls can you eat? And he's going from one restaurant to the other restaurant to the other, and he's walking all the way to the old city, and 
either can't find a rest home where he feels there's a reliable Ashgacha. And finally, there is a rest home where a reliable Ashgacha. There's a line six blocks long, and the guy's taken in his buddies ahead, you know, and they walk away, and they, they wind up in Rechavia by a friend of his. He says, you know, we're just walking two and a half hours <laughs> to get him, you know. And they finally went to one store. The guy says, no, no, I only have, to, my, I only have a few chickens left, and I have to leave it for my customers. So the, after two hours, they finally find a restaurant. So he said that, you know, I had a feeling we're here for a reason. Where my children are still where I am today. And sure enough, he said, a childhood friend walks in of his, and the man looks like he's collapsing. Bones. Nothing there. And he says to me, you okay? And he says, no. Nah. Doctors told him he, had, uh, he has two weeks to live. He said, when? He said, a couple of months ago. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's living on a cherub chada. And he's making jokes, and he's running back and forth, and saying, what? What? He goes, I'm not going to be sad. I'm not going to be sad. He said, every second that Hashem gives me life, I'm going to smile to my kids. I'm going to smile to my kids. He says he, that it was when he was in the ward over there, and there was a young bacher that was told that it's not so geschmack, his, his physical, his medical situation, he started to cry. So why are you crying? No one knows anything. You've got to be happy. This is my thing. I've got to be happy the last minute. He comes in, he dances, and he walks out. He says, look, I, no one should be tested. Chas v'shalom. But he said, he said to his family, so what's our excuse? What's our excuse not to be happy? Worried about this, worried about that. You're alive. You have someone to smile at. Smile at him. It's worth walking two hours. It says, Gol so Yehuda me'oyni. Yehuda went into Gol is me'oyni. What does oyni mean? So there's, there's two sheets in the Medjish. One says because they did not fulfill the mitzvah of lechem oyni. And some say, Gol so Yehuda me'oyni because they did not fulfill the mitzvah of giving meiser oyni. So the Chidah says, we do two things. We say, Holach na'an. You see Hashem? I'm doing the mitzvah lechem oini, and I didn't fulfill my seroni. Didn't give tzedakah. Kol dich me yesi v'yachol. Let anyone come to eat. So I fixed the uh, gulsi yudah me oini. So the meila shata hacha l'shana bo b'nei charin. I heard a vote from Rabbi Yisrael Dilmer, extremely chashiv year from the son of Yosef, uh, big big the big tzaddikim in Yerushalayim. He said the first night of Pesach corresponds to which night? Right, Tishabah. Apash, Aleph is the tough. That's how we eat the egg. Whatever the first night, the first night, if, 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 Tisha, if Pesach, first day of Pesach this year is Shabbos, Tisha B'Av is on Shabbos. Of course, it gets pushed off on Sunday. But it's always the same day. There's an inherent connection between Pesach and Tisha B'Av. Why is that? Pesach is ultimate cheres, Tisha B'Av is ultimate opposite of cheres. Parents say it's all the Rabbi Nishlam, when things go our way and when things don't go our way. But, so he said, Amari de Gavart, what started Tisha B'Av? The story of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. Hey, you, you're by my folly, I never invited you here, get out! Get out! I'll pay you for half the meal. Get out! This is my simcha! Get out, okay? As you get closer to Pesach and you didn't have breakfast, lunch, and supper, your acting abilities go higher. Anyway. So, how does Kamsa Bakamsa goes out, right? So this is the night of Kamsa Bakamsa. So what do we do? If that destroyed the Vesa Mikdash, we do just the opposite. We say, Kal Dechven Yehseviachal, everyone come in to eat. That's the connection, right? We're bringing it all in. Lechem oini means uh, the ability to accept what we have. This is what you give me, a piece of matzah. This is what you have now. This is what I have to take. This is your matzah in life. Thank you, Hashem, I'm accepting it. Now, your role in life, once you accept it, who you are, is turn around and help somebody in any way that you can. Gemara says in Masech des Tainas that when Rav Huna, they went to Raf from Bar Papa, which is one of the names that you say by Siyam, and Raf Rucham, and Raf Rucham, and Raf and so, about, so Rav Papa's son, Raphram, there's a whole shy that why we say the ten sons of Rav Papa by Siam. Some say because there was Shalom amongst them, always, even though there were ten sons. Some say they gave up their beer company to learn, whatever the case may be. Could be that's why they were Shalom, because they didn't have a company to find over. But anyway, but Akhafanam, so that's what we, we say, uh, we say their names by Siam. Of course, the Heligam Eroim, uh, every one of them could have been Machai and Mason. So the Gemara says in Masech, this Tainus, that they went to Raphram Bar Papa and they said, Rav Huna is so great, tell us about Rav Huna. He says, I didn't know him when he was young. I can tell you what he did when he was old. When he was old, if the guy came in and said, the weatherman said, Rav Huna, looks like rain. Looks like rain. He would get into a gold carriage and he would ride to the streets. And if he saw a wall that was about to fall, he would order that they take it down because he was concerned that in the storm it would fall down and people would be hurt. And after the storm, he would demand that the people build it up. If the person could afford to build it up, he built it up on his own. If not, um, he, helped, he paid for it. Every Friday, the Gemara says that he went out to the vegetable market and he saw there were extra vegetables, he bought them up. So that he wanted to make sure the vendors always bring a plenty supply. Because uh, if they, Friday, if they don't sell it Friday, they're not going to sell it till Sunday, they'll get ruined. So he wanted to make sure that they bring a plenty supply, we'll always buy it up. 
And what did he do with the, with the vegetables? Anyone know? That he bought? The Mara says, he threw it into the river. Threw it into the river? Why did he throw it into the river for? Why didn't, why didn't he just give it out to the poor people? So the Gemara says, if he would give it out to the poor people, they wouldn't come to buy, because they're getting it from him. So it would be counterproductive. He wanted the people that sell the vegetables have panasa. He wanted the people in their position. Not just to be, it should be a big sign. This is the Rav Huna Foundation that gives out free vegetables. That would, may give him a much bigger pump, but it won't give him what he really felt was the highest level of tzedakah, as the Rambam says, that is to enhance everyone who they are. So the Gemara says, well, why did he throw it into the river? Well, he didn't want to give it to the poor, so why didn't he feed it to his animals? So the Gemara said that he felt that feeding human food to animals is a, is a downgrade of the food, and the way Rashi says, it shows that you're bayit the taiva sheshpia kadosh sheshpia kadosh baruch hu biyavu. Hashem gave you food for human consumption, why are you giving it to the animals? You can give the animal animal food. So therefore, he threw it into the river? Or what does that help? He'd rather give it to the animals and throw it into the river. So Rashi says, it didn't get lost in the river. It, it, it would go downstream, and it would branch out, and it would, people would take it. The mile it was, you never knew if it was going to come to you, because it depended on the currents, it depended on how the river went. So if you gave it out to everyone, it became like an entitlement. You know what happens when you get an entitlement every week? You begin to be more demanding. You don't work. It, it starts a whole negative uh, thing, right? Socialism. Socialism is great until there's no one to take from anymore. But um, the fact that it went down the river, to wherever it had to go, it also meant, like the Rambam said, lists this as one of the high levels of tzedakah, that Rav Huna, Nobody would come knocking on Rafuna's door. Thanks. Oh, I knew I could rely on you. You didn't know if you could rely on him. You never knew what the vegetables were going to wind up. And, and, and he didn't direct it. He didn't have to say, I'm giving him and not him. He insulted me and sure. Rabbi Hashem, whatever you want to give it, give it. So Rav Huna saw in his role that his role was, let me do what I can for the people around me. Not where I get the most covered, not where I get the most brownie points, not where I look the best. How can I make everyone's life? I'm not trying to change people's lives. How can I sustain their lives for who they are? So I've got to tell you this one last story. So this one really, this is the first time I'm saying this story, and uh, this really floored me. And I heard it from Rav Ben-C in Tversky, in Milwaukee, who heard it from uh, the individual. He told me the story today. He said uh, there was a yid, for whatever reason, wound up in federal prison. Um, he was caught in, in whatever he was coming to it. But he was sentenced for a year. And um, he was a young man, three children, and he said he got there and he burst into tears, just crying and crying and crying. He, was, he was, could not get a hold of himself. And uh, the first couple of days of the most difficult, just kept crying, just the tears streaming from his eyes again and again and again, beyond. And uh, it came the first day, it was time for roll call. He didn't know the rules. So he was in the bathroom crying. And he locked the door because he was in the bathroom crying. And not to show up by roll call is like the worst thing in the world. And they bang, also they, they banged the door down. There's no one hit him. The door comes crashing down. The guards grab him, throw him to the ground, cuff him, drag him off. Is the worst criminal in the world, you know, an escapee. He wasn't there by roll call. The poor guy doesn't know what hit him, and, and he's just crying his head off, and he tells the warden the truth. I, I don't know. He says, hey, well, you're, you're, first day? Already you don't show up by roll call? He says, I'm throwing you into the hole. I want to describe to you what the hole is. But basically, you're living in an in a, in a orange that's about as big as an orange for a mace, a chamal islam, for 30 days, you know, with a bucket, and food comes in through a hole in the bottom. And he goes, but I didn't know, but I was just crying. I was embarrassed. I, no, no, there's no excuses. There's law and order here. And all of a sudden, this 79-year-old yid that's there for life, don't ask me what he did, but he's there for life, okay? He walks over to the warden and says, the guy's here. He's just separated from his wife and children. He's broken. What's your business? Mind your own business. Because you're going to throw him into the hole. It's going to break him. He was crying in the bathroom. Get out of here! You want to get in trouble? You want to go into the hole yourself? He goes, you take me in instead of him, I'll go in myself. Okay. You say you want to, You have to prove a point, that it's not a hefka belt, so you throw me in. Everyone sees you prove a point. I mean, I've been through the grind of here. He says, it's not going to break me. Him, it's going to break. So take me instead of him. So the warden looks at the two of them and he goes, You Jews drive me mad! Just both of you go back to your rooms! You know, it's, it's very tough. Very tough and difficult situations to be able to look at someone else and say, the 
I don't want to be a hero. Tell me. Tell me what I have to do in this given moment. And then you are the greatest hero. And then you are Zaycha to the greatest level of Cheres. And then we are Zaycha to a Shata Hacha Lashon Abad and Echayim. Shata Hacha Lashon Abad Yishalai. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.